I'm so sorry. Uh, it's nice to see you. I've seen you around here a bunch. Um, I'm Jake, by the way. Hi, Jake. I'm Tess. It's nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you too, Tess. Hey, I'm so sorry. I gotta go. I'm running late for church. No way. I think I am too. Where do you go to church at, by the way? Oh, landing place down on Chambers. Seriously? I just started working there. I'm the new worship arts resident. Dude, no way. I recently started working there. No way. Way. Well, Tess, I hate to do this to you, but I have to go do the welcome this morning. Dude, me too. Well, we better get going then, because I think we're pretty late. Okay. Let's get out of here. See ya. Welcome to our online experience. We are so glad that you joined us today. If you're new, looking for prayer, or wanting to connect with us, please text NEW to the number below and fill out a connection card. We also have the top three. If you'd like to know what's going on here at Landing Place, you can look at our app or our website to find out more. You can also join us in a time of generosity by texting Landing Place to the number below. Thank you for joining us and have a blessed day. Morning, how are you doing this morning? It's good to see you today.
come to sing of your faithfulness, God. We come to sing. And we won't hold anything back from you this morning, Father. Holding nothing back, God. We don't want to hold back our worship this morning, Father. We want to sing how much we love you. Come on, sing. I can't hold back my praise. Sing it.
sound amazing. Hey. Hey. Woo. And we won't be quiet. Come on. We shout out. faithful. Amen. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, we're just so thankful today, celebrating in your presence for your goodness and your faithfulness to every single one of us here during the seasons of our life. You, Lord, yeah. For your mercy never fails me in all my days. I've been held in
so I've never experienced that faithfulness that you're singing about. Today, I believe you're going to encounter Jesus in a way that you never have before. He's going to come in and he's going to show himself faithful to you in your life. You know, so it's hard, right? We all have situations or seasons in our life where we felt like we're great seasons. We've all had seasons in our life that perhaps we felt like they were the worst of seasons, but through it all, you're standing here today by the grace of God. And that's what we're singing about today. It's His grace. Sing all my life you have, all my life you have been faithful. so good to someone that you've never met before and you can have a seat today. Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to Landing Place Church one more time. It's so nice to see your faces. Oh, man. You look good. So whether you're here in person, whether you're online, we want to welcome you. We're in week four of a series. So if you're just jumping in, uh, we're week four of a series we're calling Connecting the Dots. What we've been trying to do is we've been looking at God's story and figuring out where it intersects with our story. How does our story fit into God's story? That's kind of the question we're looking at. So I want to start off today with a question for you. How many of you have moved into a new place of living, whether new or used, in the last five years? Hands? Would you just keep your hands up for just a second? How many of you moved in the last 10 years? How about 15? Okay, where are my 20s? Wow. Okay, cool. So for those of you online... 90% of our people have our hands up. So particularly in this neighborhood, we, we moved in 15 years ago, so we're like long-termers here. Uh, 15 years ago, we came out and we started looking at houses, and we actually live just down the street, actually. Our backyard is in Chambers Road, just like the front of our house is here. And we bought our house when it was in studs. Somebody had started a contract, dropped a contract, we snuck in and, and grabbed it. So we didn't have to pick out anything structural. But we did have to pick out cabinets. We had to pick out flooring. We had to go to the... Anybody been to one of those uh, design centers? Whew. Talk about choices, right? And we're not... Ah, we're decoratingly challenged at our house. Um, I remember going to the design center. They go, okay, you need to pick all this stuff out. And we're like, we got nothing. Pick out something that looks really nice that you like and we'll pay for it. That's great. We'll just do whatever you think we should do, basically, because we don't have any taste. And uh, there's so many decisions, aren't there? We spend so much time researching and looking at floor plans, looking at models, 
going to different houses, visiting, trying to find just the right school district, just the right neighborhood. We spend so much time on the places that we live, do we not? And nobody tells you, like, when you move in, there's going to be more work. Particularly in a new build, right? New build, nobody told us all about landscaping, about blinds, about paint. Like, it never ends, does it? We spend an inordinate amount of time in thinking about paying for the place that we live, which is really very temporary. Most of us will live in a house, maybe five, maybe ten in this neighborhood. Twenty would be a long time to live in a house. But you know what we almost never think about, even those who call ourselves Jesus followers, even those who are churchgoers? We almost never think about where we're going to spend all of eternity. You're going to spend a few years in houses here. <laughs> You're going to spend forever in eternity. And yet, we spend very little time thinking about, very little time planning, very little time investigating, checking it out, checking out the neighborhood to see what's going to happen there. Almost no time at all. And I have to ask the question, why is that? Because I grew up in church. And they said, hey, when you die, you're going to go to heaven. But they didn't really tell me at all what heaven was going to look like. And so largely my picture of heaven was shaped by media. You know, you got fat little chubby kids playing harps on clouds, <laughs> right? You got wings, you got halos. Or it was an eternal church service that never ended. I love Jesus. I love worship. But if either one of those pictures are accurate, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not that excited about what it holds. And if I'm just really straight up honest with you, probably like most Americans, I'm pretty happy here. I love a lot of things about this world. I love looking out my kitchen window in the morning and seeing the mountains with the sun coming up over the horizon and hitting those mountains and the snow. I love that. I love a hot cup of hazelnut coffee in the morning sitting in my hands, steaming up into my nose. I love that. I love berry drizzled cheesecake. I love my family. I love my church. I'm going to be honest with you, there's a lot of things I love about this world. And I think I could get pretty excited about just staying here for a while longer. And I'm not even sure that there's times where I'm really all that excited about what's coming up. But what if we've been sold a bad bill of goods? What if we've been misled about what eternity really looks like for those who say yes to Jesus? I don't think we think nearly as much about that as we could or we should. And so today, we're going to hear about it. Now, we've been covering the overarching story of God from the very beginning to the very end. The first week, we talked about creation. It's hard to believe and hard for us to imagine today, but God created a perfect world where everything worked beautifully and where people liked each other and there wasn't any conflict and there wasn't any racism and there weren't any wars and they didn't have people shooting each other. It was a perfect world. The second week, Pastor Roger talked about the fall, and the fall was where it all fell apart. Adam and Eve eat the fruit, sin enters the world, so does death, so does disease, so do all the bad things that happen to us. Last week, we got to the dot of redemption where we learned that Jesus came along and he said, hey, the problem from the fall is sin. Somebody's going to need to pay for that. And it can either be you or, or it can be me. And I'm willing to take your penalty. And we learned that as individuals, we can become redeemed. We can be bought back at a price. And Jesus offers that to all of us, and that's really cool. But we still live in a really broken world, don't we? We still live in a world with death and disease and racism and people killing each other and all kinds of things. And so today we sort of get to that last dot, that ending of the story. Because fortunately, our story doesn't end there, neither is God's. Today we move into that fourth dot in our series, and that's called restoration. What is restoration? Let me give you a definition. Restoration is a return to the former, the original, the unimpaired state. In other words, there's a day coming when God is going to restore 
this earth, this planet, back to the original manufacturer specs, back to the beginning, back to when it was perfect, back to Eden. And I'm going to argue even better. So why do we have so many misconceptions about what heaven looks like? Well, the truth is, very few of us make it to the end of the story. Can I just be honest with you? Has anybody tried to read the book of Revelation, the very last book of the Bible? Has anyone else sound confusing other than me? So I'm in a men's small group on Tuesday mornings. We meet every Tuesday morning at the ungodly hour of 5.30 a.m. <laughs> and we're going through the book of Revelation right now. And by the way, it's Revelation, not Revelations. There was only one. And it was John. John, who was one of Jesus' followers, one of Jesus' disciples. John, who describes himself as the disciple Jesus loved four times. John, who was the one who outran Peter to the grave on Easter morning. That John. At the end of his life, John is sentenced to live on the island of Patmos, which is in the middle, and uh, really, it's toward the Turkey side. It's really not in the middle of the Mediterranean. Greek island, you think it's a great place if you've got to be holed up in jail somewhere. Patmos probably not a bad place. While John is there, he is actually taken up to get a glimpse of what the next world looks like. Now, the book of Revelation, the Revelation of John contains a lot of things. We go from the rapture of the church to a seven-year tribulation period. We have a millennial period. We have the battle of Armageddon. We're not going to wander through any of those things today. Unfortunately, because it does get so bogged down, because it does get so complicated, a lot of people stop reading. And they never make it to the second to the last chapter of the Bible, which is Revelation 21, where it describes <laughs> where we're going to spend of eternity. And there's some really interesting facts about where we're going to spend all of eternity. And I think we better know, right? So we are going to dive into the 21st chapter of the book of Revelation. If you've got a hard copy of the Bible, open that thing all the way to the back. Second to the last chapter. We're going to see how the story actually ends. Now, the first thing I'm going to tell you, and it's going to kind of blow your mind, is you're probably not going to spend eternity in heaven. Uh, air gasping moment. You're probably going to spend eternity on a restored earth. Isn't that mind-blowing? You're probably going to spend eternity on a restored earth. Mark, you've got to be kidding me. No, let's read. I'll give you 10 facts about eternity on a restored earth. And I'm going to tell you, this is not exhaustive list. These are just 10 of my top 10 things about heaven and about the new earth. Number one, it is new and it is improved. How many like new and improved stuff, right? I always like when they come out with a new product. It's rarely new or improved. It's usually repackaged and remarketed. This is actually really new and really improved. First verse, 21st chapter of Revelation, this is John. He's getting a glimpse of what eternity looks like for us. I want to give you an accurate picture of what it looks like. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. And the sea, the ocean, gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. So what's going to happen to this earth? If you read through the book of Revelation, it takes quite a beating during the tribulation period. There's hail, there's infestations, there are pandemics like we have never seen before. But at the end of the day, this earth ends. All the pollution all the climate change, all the global warming, all the things that are concerns to us now in that day will be of no concern to us whatsoever because all of it will be wiped out and God creates a new earth and a new heaven. And guess where we're going to live? The new earth, the restored earth. It's going to be new, it's going to be improved. So, you're not going to be a fat little angel sitting around playing a harp, just worshiping all day. You're going to be on a beautifully restored planet. You're going to be a place with mountains, apparently not oceans, but mountains, 
This is why we live in Colorado, right? You're going to enjoy everything you enjoy on this earth, but it's going to be better. There'll be no pollution. There'll be no smog. It's just going to be perfectly restored. It's going to be new and improved. The second thing we learn about this is that God lives with us. You know, people from the beginning of time have craved God's presence. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had unlimited access to God. They could walk in the garden with them. It was very cool. And then when sin came, they were separated from God, and now God was now reduced to a tabernacle or to a temple. In the new heaven and the new earth, John goes on in verse 3 and says this, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. That's us. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God, He says it again. God himself will be with them. The barrier we have to God right now in this particular life is sin. And yes, we can be redeemed, and the price for sin is paid for us individually. But on a whole, when the earth is restored, God will be with us. We will see him face to face. We will hang out together. And that's going to be cool. If you ever experienced God's presence, even for a moment, you know that it's a sort of euphoric, cool, really amazing feeling. It's going to be that way all the time. I don't know about you. That's something to look forward to. Number three, all the bad stuff of this earth is gone forever. The next verse says this, he's going to wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death. There's going to be no more sorrow. There's going to be no more crying and there's going to be no more pain. All of these things are gone forever. Think about the worst pain in your life. Maybe it was a relational breakup. Maybe it was the death of someone really close to you. Maybe you lost your job or you had a financial setback. Think how bad you felt in that moment. You will never feel that way in the restored earth. Ever. It's gone forever. This life is a little bit like a country western song, isn't it? Truck stops running. Girlfriend runs away. Dog dies. The restored earth is like playing the record backwards. The dog comes back to life, the girlfriend returns, and the truck starts again. It just doesn't get any better than that. This is what we have to look forward to. The next thing we learn about the restored earth, it is ginormous. It is huge. How big is it? Thank you. I appreciate that. Y'all are catching on. We skip ahead to verse 15. The angel who talked to me held in his hand a gold measuring stick to measure the, earth, the, the city, its gates, and its wall. When he measured it, he found it was square, as wide as it was long. In fact, it wasn't just wide and long. It was high, too. Its length and width and height were 1,400 miles. Then he measured the walls and found it to be 216 feet thick. Okay, I'm going to take a break. We live in 2D right now, don't we? Right? For the most part. We've got tall buildings, but for the most part, we live in two dimensions. We live length and width. 1,400 miles roughly is about New York City to Dallas, just to give you a, a feel for what 1,400 miles looks like. It's going to be that long, that wide, but here's the kicker. It's going to be that high. Currently, the tallest building in the world is in Dubai. It is 2,722 feet tall. That seems enormously tall, doesn't it? The New Jerusalem will be, get this, 3,000 times higher than that building. And you're asking the question, Mark, how? What good does three dimensions do us if we're two-dimensional? Guess what? We're not 2D anymore. Because you know what happens in the new world? There's no gravity. So we can move this way. We can move this way. We can move this way. How many of you like to fly a little bit? Hmm? How many of you like to just move from place to place, not have to think about it? 
1,400 miles high. Some of the tallest 14ers here in Colorado are less than three miles. We're talking 1,397 miles higher. We're talking where satellites are orbiting. It's that big. Why is the sea gone? <laughs> they need to make room. <laughs> and you know what seas do? They divide people into people groups. New Jerusalem, there are no people groups. There's no different races. There's no different languages. There's no different colors of skin. We are one. We are one. I don't know about you. That sounds pretty good to me right now. All right, number five, you're going to like this. There is bling and lots of it. How many of you like bling? Who has some bling on right now? Anybody have, anybody have gold or any uh, precious stone on them right now? I got one right here. I got both, right? Yeah. We love bling. Have you ever wondered why? I have a son right now who's in the engagement process. Uh, he bought an engagement ring, and, and it made me think of this social construct we have of buying, spending thousands of dollars for really little rocks. <laughs> like, who invented this? Well, I'll tell you who invented it. Jewelers did. But uh, why do we like gold? I mean, gold has been, you can read back throughout all of history, all of written history, no matter what segment of human history you look at. And gold has always had intrinsic value to us as human beings. Shiny rocks have always had intrinsic value to us. Why is that? Have you ever asked yourself why that is? Why do we love gold and why do we love jewelry and why do we love stones so much? Why do we spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on these things? It could be because we're made in God's image. And it could be that God loves bling. <laughs> to which you ask, how much does God love bling? Let's read. Thank you for asking. Skip ahead to verse 18. There's a wall around the city. The wall was made of jasper, precious gem. The city was pure gold, as clear as glass. That wall, that 216-foot wall of the city was built on foundation stones inlaid with 12 precious stones. Then it goes on to list all 12 stones we still use today. There are 12 gates in this particular city wall, and guess what? They're all made of pearls. The pearly gate thing is legit. <laughs> it's the one piece of folklore about heaven that's actually biblically correct. There are gates, and each gate is made from a single pearl. Now, I don't know how big the gates are because it doesn't say, but the walls are 216 feet thick. How big do you think them pearls are? I'm guessing pretty big. And the main street was pure gold, as clear as glass. You see, what we think is luxurious in this life are paving stones and building blocks for God. He says, yeah, that stuff, that stuff you spend lots of money on, yeah, we're going to use them to, to put the foundation of the walls in. We're going we're to coat the streets in them. Because that's what heaven's going to look like. That's what the new earth, that's what a restored earth looks like. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I can't wait for that. Now, I think the real question you're all asking in the back of your mind is, does St. Peter really stand at the pearly? He says, you're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus said, you know, Peter, it's cool that you got the answer right, but you didn't get that from your own. God told you that. But on that truth, I'm going to build my kingdom. And the very gates of hell will not prevail against the kingdom. And usually stop there. But the next line says this. And Peter, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of God. So people have loosely interpreted that the pearl gates have locks. Peter has the key and he's going to be standing there. We have no other biblical reference to indicate that that is true. So you can hang on to that. Do with it what you will. Number six, and some of you are going to be so happy about this, we will never, ever be late for church again. <laughs> for some of you, this is a struggle more than others. It's difficult to get here. I know. It's 1045. Is it the, like the crack of dawn? <laughs> but you're never, ever going to be late to church again. You know why? 
because there's no church. We'll pick it up in verse 22. I saw no temple in the city. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, who is Jesus, are its temple. If we go back to the presence of God, we've always had this desire to be in God's presence. In the wilderness, God's presence was limited to the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle. And if you wanted to connect with God, if you wanted to be in God's presence, you had to go there. When they built the temple, Solomon, they put the ark behind a big curtain, and only one person got to go in and connect with God every year, and that was the high priest, and he would receive forgiveness, and he would confess their sins. And then when Jesus came, he was here in the flesh, and the people that actually connected with Jesus were actually in God's presence. And then when Jesus went back to heaven and the Holy Spirit came for all those who believe, we now carry the Holy Spirit. We carry God's presence in us, and it's really cool that we can all get together in a building where all of this presence of God is presence in one place. But in heaven, everybody is in God's presence. You don't have to go to a place. You don't have to show up on time. You're just in God's presence, which I think is pretty cool. You never have to worry about being late to church again. Number seven, there is absolutely no sunburn in the restored earth. Some of you are about to go out and get torched this summer. Some of you are already a little red. We went down to spring break, went to Orlando with my, my teenage daughter and two of her teenage friends. And uh, I love these girls, but they're all really pasty white. <laughs> Not unlike myself. But my wife and I are smart enough to sit in the shade. They were not. Absolutely burnt to a crisp. I mean, like, I can't lay down on bed, have the sheet on me sort of burnt. Not fun at all. If you've ever been sunburned like that, you know how incredibly painful that is. But I got good news. In a restored earth, you are never going to get sunburned again. Here's what it says. The city, the restored city, has no need of sun or moon. For the glory of God illuminates the city, and the Lamb is its light. There are no planets, there are no sun, there's no moon, there's no need. And you know what that means? There's no shadows. There's nothing to hide. There's no dark alleys. Everything is lit and everything is beautifully illuminated. Number eight. I love this one. We are protected from evil. Revelation 20, 27 says this, Nothing evil will be allowed to enter, nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry or dishonesty, but only those whose names are written in the book of life, Lamb's book of life. So we're in a gated community. There's a 216-foot wall all the way around the city. Nobody gets in, nobody gets out except those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. What is that about? Because that sounds pretty exclusive, right? Sounds like, hey, if I don't make the book, I'm not getting into that restored earth, and that's very true. There's some beliefs out there right now, and and there's a, a push within sort of what they call progressive Christianity that says, you know, at the end of the day, everybody's going to spend eternity with God. At the end of the day, everybody's going to get another chance. At the end of the day... God would never, ever keep somebody outside of this incredibly walled-off, restored earth. But actually, God's Word doesn't say that at all. God actually says there there are people who are going to be inside the wall, and there are going to be people who are outside the wall. That sounds pretty exclusive, but actually it's incredibly inclusive. Because everybody's invited to the new heaven and the new earth. No one is excluded. No one is excluded based on race. Nobody's excluded based on wealth. Nobody's excluded even on how bad they messed up in this life. Every single person is invited. When we say yes to Jesus' forgiveness, when we say yes to Jesus, you paid my sin so I don't have to, our name gets written in that Lamb's Book of Life. And you know what? Nobody can take it out. Once it's in, it's in. No matter what happens at that stage, 
you're going to spend eternity in this new earth, in this new heaven. I hear all the time, recently just met with somebody, and they were talking about somebody who had passed on, and we were talking about, you know, where do you think they are? And, and her reasoning for hoping for her loved one was she was really a pretty good person. Mark, she was really a good person. And unfortunately, it's really not being about being good. I know that's the prevailing thought in our country today. If you're a pretty good person, that, that's who gets to spend the time in the restored. That's actually not at all what God said. God said it's the forgiven person. Because honestly, when we get really down to it, none of us are good. None of us are perfect. We've all fallen short of God's standard of perfection. The people written in the Lamb's book of life are those who said yes to Jesus. They're not the ones who behaved the best. And that gives us hope for those of us who are on this end of the spectrum who are going, yeah, I've struggled. We get a shot at it just like everybody else does. Whether you're son of Sam or Mother Teresa, everybody comes to God the exact same way, through the blood of Jesus. All right, we're protected from evil. Number nine, Fido made the final cut. This is for all of you who sent me nasty emails after week one when I told you your pet did not have a soul or a spirit, and they were not created in God's image, and you were very disappointed with me, with God, with everything. But I've got good news for you today. I've been waiting. I didn't respond to you <laughs> privately because I wanted to respond publicly. John wasn't the only one who tells us about the new heaven and the new earth. There was an Old Testament prophet named Isaiah, and Isaiah talked about the days to come as well, a thousand years before Jesus was born. Isaiah wrote this in Isaiah 11, 6 and 8, as he talks about the restored heaven, restored earth. In that day, the wolf and the lamb will live together. Now, in case you don't know how the food chain works, wolves typically like to eat lambs. The leopard will lay down with the baby goat, same thing. The calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion. You picking up on the pattern here? And a little child will lead them all. The cow will graze near the bear. The cub and the calf will lay down together. The lion will eat hay like a cow instead of a cow. The baby will play safely near the hole of a cobra. Yes, a little child will put its hand in the nest of deadly snakes without harm. Here's good news. There will be animals in the restored earth. Animals will be all over, and they'll be nice. You'll be able to pet a tiger. How cool is that? You'll be able to have a lion as a pet. Now, I cannot guarantee that your dog, your cat, your gerbil will be there. But they might. They might. We don't know. But there are going to be animals. So if you're, if you're thinking, oh, I can't imagine an eternity without animals. No sweat. Fido made the final cut. I will accept apologies as of tomorrow morning. <laughs> Written, e however you want to do it. I'm good. I'm good. No problem. Not bitter. Number 10, final thing. The food is amazing. The food is amazing. Here's what Jesus had to say in Luke, speaking of this new heaven, this new earth we get to live in. Just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I now grant you the right to eat and to drink at my table in my kingdom. I want you to picture the best food you've ever put in your mouth. Heaven's going to be better than that. All you can eat, all you can drink. It's like Golden Corral on steroids, <laughs> but better food. You can eat whatever you want, and guess what? You will never get fat. You will never count calories. You'll never think twice. Isn't that great? Somebody should be clapping, standing up. Hallelujah. Amen. Doesn't that sound amazing? I don't know about you. I love this life. 
And we're really privileged to live where we do, the way we do. And in fact, I think sometimes as Americans, we get so caught up trying to create heaven on earth, we really don't even think that there's something that could possibly be better. And yet everything that I read about this new heaven and new earth makes this earth pale by comparison. So then the real question becomes, Mark, why can't we just get this over and go now? Like, that sounds great. I'm ready. Sign me up. When is Jesus going to come back and just usher us in? Well, 2 Peter gives us an answer to that question, and it's a good question. He said this, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, his promise to come back. As some people think, no, he's being patient for your sake. You know why? Because he doesn't want anybody to be destroyed. But he wants everyone to repent. Why doesn't Jesus come back and just end this thing? Because our work isn't done here yet. Because maybe not all of us in this room are listening to the sound of my voice have really decided to turn from their sin, which is the word repent, and turn to God. Maybe there's somebody in our life that we love so much we cannot imagine spending eternity without who hasn't made that decision yet. They're the ones Jesus is waiting for. And until Jesus comes back, we only really have one responsibility. And that's to tell people that there's a better place than here. For all of eternity. So I'd ask you two questions today as we wrap up this entire series. Do you know for 100%, absolutely, positively, without any shadow of a doubt, that your name is written in that book of life? If you have the slightest hint of I'm not sure, I want to give you an opportunity to be sure before you leave here today. Second question is this. Who is it in your life that you cannot imagine spending all of eternity without. And what are you going to do about it? Because you may be the only person that God has put in their path to share the good news. That there's a day coming that's so much better. So much better than anything we've ever experienced. If you're not sure today, I want to give you an opportunity to have a conversation with God right now. Because I want you to be absolutely sure that with all your planning about where you live right now, that you've spent just a moment thinking about where you're going to spend all of eternity. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes if you would, bow your head. And if you're not sure, you can have a conversation with God inside your head right now that goes something like this. God, Today I recognize that I have fallen short of your standard of perfection. Today I choose to turn away from my sin and to turn toward you. I believe you sent your son Jesus to this earth to pay a penalty that I owed, to pay a debt that I incurred. And I understand now that you're offering me to pay that debt. And I want to say yes to that. I want to receive your forgiveness. I want a clean slate. I want a fresh start. I want to spend all of eternity in this place that you talked about. This new heaven, this new earth, this holy city. I want to experience that. Did you say yes to God? Your entire eternity shifts. Today, God, 
We just thank you. And we love you. And we just sit back and imagine what it's going to look like when we get to see you face to face. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.